Okay, so I'm just going to talk today and I'll talk for a while and then just show a little video clip at the end. Um, Bill has given you the topic, you know it already, it's a research topic that's occupied me in various ways for the last decade, but chiefly on a major project which has run for the last four years is now coming to an end, in which I was associated with at the beginning, although not any longer. Um, but it raises very general questions. There is a demo. Demos, of course, you, you'll, see a, you'll see a video of a real demo, but of course, you, I'm sure you're all cynical enough not to be taken in by computer demos, but it is real. Something is running underneath. It's not fake tap and spatch together, patch cock together. But um, uh, it's very early days and nothing rests on anything I show you. All I'm throwing out are various ideas of the ways things of this general sort might go. Um, hmm. Yes, there we go. Uh, plan of the talk. So I'll, I'll talk about what I'll call the companion's vision. That's rather a sort of wide sort of thing to say, isn't it? But I'll talk about a particular kind of companion, the senior companion, which was um, a, an idea and a demonstration that occupied the first half of this major European four-year project now ending. Um, I'll talk about some technical features underlying it, but they're a very general sort. There's perhaps only one or two slides, even marginally techy, and I can rush those through very fast. But there, there were meant to be some general experimental technical ideas underneath it to make it work. Um, then I shall ask at the end, as Bill said, some more, slightly more general social questions as to what should companions be like, what social problems might they bring if we had them, just in case we want to stop it all now. Um, any of you, and I know there are some of you in the audience, not only Bill, who've seen any of me talk about any of this before, we'll see a few slides you've seen before. I'm sorry, I'm a kind, I just, one of my many faults is I can't give up on a good old slide. Um, however, I've seen some new faces here, so I, I should be thinking of you. <laughs> um, machine dialogue. That's been the topic of, behind this in technical terms. It's been my topic for the last 10 years. How, how do we talk to computers? How can we get them to talk with us in an interesting way and not just sell us railway tickets? Um, when I put NLP there, that means natural language processing. I should have spelled it out. That's the broad domain I work in, language processing by computers, processing of ordinary language. It's been the Cinderella of language processing. It's been huge successes in things like machine translation. You probably know you can all go to Google Translate and translate to almost any language now. That's computation over prose. It works pretty well. There are still a few people around in some backward who think machine translation doesn't work, but it does. It really does work. It's been a great success. It's the proof that computers can handle language, whether or not they understand it. It's much harder to do work with dialogue, largely because human dialogue, as you know, isn't like prose. We don't speak. There are a few people who speak in fully formed sentences. That I know the names of some of them, a few people in Parliament. Basically, we don't talk in fully formed sentences. We chop things up, we leave gaps, we repeat ourselves, like I'm doing now. Um, a lot of what passes for theory in this area can be vacuous. You find textbooks that begin, dialogues are systems of turn-taking. Yes, 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 this is true. Um, um, for many researchers, and this is true in many areas of artificial intelligence, um, this is still an area where you're not so much interested in dialogue itself, but you have a theory to sell, and you're going to sell that theory. You believe in a particular kind of logic, or a particular kind of statistics, and you're going to try and make it work here. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, theory does, or should, precede research. But it, it can, this can often show as simply a demonstration of a particular kind of theory. Here's the most important point, though. Um, a man called Ed Feigenbaum uh, caused a stir many years ago at an AI artificial intelligence conference of, of psychologists, cognitive psychologists, and he said to them, he said, in a very aggressive way, he was an AI person like me, he said, um, surely, he said, there's no research in cognitive psychology except what's based on what artificial intelligence has told you. In other words, you have no models but computer models. And many of them looked shocked and horrified, but it was quite hard to answer him. He was broadly right. And the trouble is, and I'm just extending this to what I'm saying to you now, um, because nearly all work on machine dialogue has concentrated on tasks, sorry, on dialogue about tasks, um, machine conversations that will sell you a railway ticket or check your bank balance, move funds for you in a bank account. Um, therefore, we've almost come to believe that dialogue is about tasks and it's about carrying out tasks and, and that we in general have conversations with each other so as to carry out tasks and to get people to do things. Now, this is not true. If you, in the old days, those of you who remember phone boxes, if you ever stood outside a phone box, you know, rapping on the glass after three minutes to get somebody out, um, when I was a small boy, when three minutes was supposed to be the only decent English person could talk, you know it wasn't true. People just stand in there and talk. They just talk. There's no task. They're just going on. They're doing what I'm doing now. Um, it, it, so what I'm saying is Feigenbaum was right that the idea that conversation is to serve tasks is only partly true, as so many theories. There have been emotional, I'm, and I haven't said the word emotion yet, but an awful lot of the current talk about machine dialogue is, if it's not going to do tasks, can they in some sense have 
some sort of emotional or affective, there are various technical terms for this, relationships with us so that we want to engage with them. They aren't just tinny voices selling us tickets. And I'll just remind you here that we've had 40 years of quite impressive um, emotional conversation, emotionally satisfying conversationalists. Um, Colby at uh, Stanford in the early 70s had a project called Parry. Colby was a psychiatrist, Parry was paranoid. And um, Par Parry was the most robust computer conversationalist ever, um, far better than Eliza. Eliza got all the publicity, you know, VHS um, won out over Betamax, you know all these stories. The good don't always win. Um, and Parry got no publicity, Eliza got it all. Eliza was awful, Parry was rather wonderful. Here's just a random snippet of Parry. Parry is in capital letters. Um, he could go on like this for hours. It never broke down. It always appeared. It was a paranoiac, and therefore, it, once you could touch on a subject like the horses or horses or um, Italian Americans or the racetracks that it was paranoid about, it would begin to spew out masses of angry stuff about how it <laughs> loathed Italians. And uh, but it was all quite fun. It was quite fun. It wasn't boring anyway. So there's been a lot. Of, this stuff's been around for a long time. The problem is, are we doing any better now? He had two variables he called fear and anger that went up and down according to what you said to it. And if you made it frightened and fear went up, it would perhaps stop talking to you. He had an idea for over 40 years ago, very clearly, of what it was to put something like an emotional reaction into a computer and have it respond in a way appropriate to that. Um, in the 1970s then, there were things that are arguably as good as much of what we've got now. And in a very broad generalization, I'd say approaches to machine conversation have fallen to two types. They fell into it in 1970. They fall into it now. There are tight systems that know a lot about something, about your bank account, about all the... The Virgin train system is a very good one on the telephone. If you know it, there are 2,000 railway stations in Britain. It can recognize, by and large, every one when you say it, which is tricky. It's a very good piece of work. It'll sell you a ticket very efficiently. Um, it knows a lot about a tiny thing like railway tickets. It knows absolutely nothing else. It can only recognize speech on a subject that it knows about, and they're very small. Winograd Shergloo, 40 years ago, was exactly such a system. There's wide, shallow systems with little knowledge, uh, very high performance. They'll talk about anything in some sense, um, like Colby's Parry. And academically, virtually all published systems have formed to the first group. The second group has not been very respectable academically. Let me generalize over that a bit further. These didactic slides, stop in a minute, there'll be some pictures and movement and pictures of small girls. Um, there, are, there are four broad approaches to um, machine dialogue now. One is what people sometimes disparagingly call chatbots. I don't use that word in disparaging. They're the inheritors of Colby. Parry. They, you can find them on the web. Some are awful, some are quite good. A new one I found this week is from the company called Dayden. I think I've spelled that right. Um, apologies to him if I haven't. I only read, typed it out about an hour ago. Um, where um, some of them are good enough so that they have a feature that I shall play up a lot in what I have to say, that they can go to the internet in real time and find data about you and about the world. Um, but, and some of them are getting into commercial systems now. And they grew out of Things like Parry, things like the Lobner competition, if you've ever heard of that. If you're interested in this, look at the Lobner competition, L-O-E-B-D-N-O-E-B-N-E-R. We have in this room David Levy, the only person who's won the Lobner competition twice. It's the competition every year for the best talking program of the year, the best machine conversationalist, the best chatbot, whatever you want to call it. Um, it it's, it's done a lot to advance the technology. Um, there's a second category, which you mostly find in universities, which are a lot, basically logic-based systems pushing a logic theory. The, the best known is Trindy, known as the Information Upstate, State Update System. They know a lot more than chatbots. They're quite difficult to make perform. They're intellectually interesting. The third, and in some ways I think the most intellectually challenging type, challenging to my position anyway, are extensions of speech engineering methods. Steve Young is the professor of engineering in... Um, in Cambridge, who has probably created the best speech understanding for English system for English in the world. He sold it to Microsoft. Um, he believes that the methods he used in engineering to do speech understanding, now speech understanding is different from what I've been talking about. It's not understanding what you say, it's taking the speech wave and translating essentially into written language. You can buy such a system for $100 now for your laptop. You can speak to it, you can dictate your lectures, and they'll appear on the screen. All it does is to all, it's a very considerable achievement, takes speech, turns it into words, written words. It doesn't claim to understand what you're saying. Young has gone further, and he's in a fine tradition. He's gone further and claimed that he believes linguists, logic people, artificial intelligence people, people like me, won't crack the problem of understanding it dialogue, it will be cracked by speech engineers extending their reach into understanding. 
Now, this isn't a new claim. There's a, this was claimed very famously by Fred Jelinek 20 years ago. Um, Jelinek is a man who has as much claim as anybody to have created the what we call the statistical revolution in language understanding in the last 20 years. Jelinek was, like Young, a speech scientist who did great work on speech recognition. One day he came up with a brand new claim. He said, to hell with linguists, we can do machine translation by these methods. And he proceeded to, working at IBM, and he created a system called Candide, which he demonstrated around 1990, which translated from English to French, as he said, without knowing a word of French. All it knew were the statistics of parallel texts. He, they did know some French, really, of course. He was a Central European, of course he did. But the joke was, he said, linguistics is not necessary for this. We can do it by statistics. It was a stunning claim. He gave stunning demonstrations. He, he got approximately half the sentences right. Fairly short sentences, but not terrible, up to 12 words, translated from English to French. Um, you can take two views of that. One view is to say, my goodness, he got half of them right. How amazing. The other view is to say, he only got half of them right. Um, uh, it's exactly the same result. I mean, I was in the group initially who said he only got half of them right, but I've come round to the view, how amazing, he got half of them right. Because there was no linguistics, no syntax, no semantics, okay, no dictionaries. He now admits that... The result, the, the result was true. He now admits the method, in a sense, was inadequate and a failure. It couldn't be extended beyond getting half right. However, it was a great foundation for everything that followed. The reason I remind you of that bit of history of machine translation is Steve Young is saying the same thing for understanding conversation. He believes, like John Eck, that by extending um, speech recognition methods with statistics, he will crack understanding. So far, after saying this for about eight years, he hasn't got further than ordering a couple of pizza toppings um, for a pizza takeout service. But, I mean, that doesn't mean he won't. The statistical, the statistical techniques required to do what he wants are very, very difficult, and he hasn't cracked them yet. It doesn't mean he won't. I don't think he will. And um, I hold what I would call a rational hybrid view, which is what I shall demonstrate to you. Uh, systems based on, as it were, large-scale symbolic structures, not statistical systems, but which take advantage of machine learning, which is what Steve Young's approach is called. And it's the original design of the Companions Project, which I shall describe to you. And several other very well-known researchers are in that broad paradigm. David Traum, who's at the Institute for Creative Technologies in Los Angeles, is probably the best-known person in the world in machine dialogue, and a colleague of mine in Florida called James Allen, who also believes that plan structures, structures of some kind. The key word here is structure. Jelinek's originality was to say there is no need for structure in the brain or the computer or anywhere to understand dialogue. You just need very good statistical results. That is the claim of Jelinek, of claim of Jelinek for translation, which didn't quite work. That is the claim for Steve Young for dialogue. I'm arguing, and I shall be presenting position for, this is no, we must have structure. It may not be conventional linguistics, but it will be structure. This talks also about computer interfaces. Um, the companion, whatever it is, will be a computer interface of some kind. Um, what are computer interfaces like? Um, this picture I showed for some years without realizing it was a, co a confidence trick. Um, so I'm still going to show it again and, re and tell you the confidence trick if you didn't know it. Um, the blurb underneath says, it's too small for you to read, that this was a, a picture a prediction in 1954 by the Rand Corporation of what the personal computer would look like in 2000 and 2004, 50 years later. And it's wonderful. And of course, there's the steering wheel there. And you think, oh, <laughs> how could they have believed the computer would, the computer interface of the future would be a thing like a room? Now, I only found out in the last two months how naive one can be. This is a very famous confidence trick. Um, it's a fake. It was faked about 15 years ago, this picture. And we ought to have realized, because apparently, for those who know, that's very obviously the steering wheel of a nuclear submarine. So if, <laughs> if, if you knew that, you wouldn't have been taken as long as I was. Anyway, but it still makes the point about interfaces have changed, probably even for nuclear submarines. They're now like this, aren't they? Or if you're more energetic and have a Wii, they're like that. Um, that's what computer interfaces are like. Um, and companions will be computer interfaces. Um, so I'm going to just now tell you something of the content of what the senior companion is before I give you a demonstration of it and, take a, and express a few general thoughts about it. Um, the senior companion is only an example. Okay, a comp companions be, can be of many types, and I will list a few types at the end. The silly companion came from an idea, which is an idea, a need, an obvious observation. The world is filling up with old people. Many of them are lonely and miserable and want someone to talk to. There aren't going to be enough people to talk to them. Um, they will have funds, however. Um, many old people live alone, and increasingly so. 
due to numbers, um, they need company. Um, they also are often, and this may go away with time, um, technically slightly backward. They, the internet isn't always for them. Uh, they're one of the groups, I think only 40% of old people's statistics show at the OII don't use the internet at all. Um, perhaps a companion driven as an internet interface should be for them, both to give them company, to bring them to the internet, to put them in touch with the world, all the reasons we give everywhere in the Internet Institute as well for why everybody should be attached to the internet in some way. But this is a special twist, which is that maybe a companion within the internet managing the life information and other needs and the need for conversation of old people could combine many things into one. Um, it doesn't have to be a screen, it doesn't have to be a technical object, the senior companion. I like to think of it as kind of, I use the phrase too often, a fairy handbag. Something warm and cosy and quite light to carry about. It could sit with you on the sofa. That's my wife's drawing of what a companion might look like. Not a real dog, but a sort of warm, furry, fake dog that can talk. Um, you'll see a talking dog later, I'm afraid. I'm rather attached to talking dogs. It could watch the television with you, remind you of the plots when you've forgotten, uh, book you a table in a restaurant, call a doctor if you're having a seizure. I mean, all the things it might do. Um, I'm more interested in the information about your life, though, and um, a theme that's become quite strong in lots of places in the last years, commercially and intellectually, have been the information of a whole life. I mean, at my age, I don't have all that much information. I have lots of boring papers on the internet, but I have daughters who have tens of thousands of photographs on the internet, and when they get to be 80, they're probably going to have millions of photographs. How can they control them? How, how can they assess them? If they, when they get old, how will they know which photographs to keep and hand on and organize? Not just photos, but their documents, their medical information, everything about them. Um, a man called Alan Dix at the University of Lancaster reckoned that if everything we ever said or did or saw, every medical reading made of us, if it was taken every few seconds, were all put together, it would only require 28 terabytes for a whole 80-year life. Um, I don't know what 28 terabytes is either, but apparently it's not as big as you might think. And it's probably no bigger than an OXO cube or will be next week. I mean, in other words, the, uh, we can talk now about what the information of an 80-year life would be like. But the trouble is, what could you do with it? I mean, you were that 80-year-old, let alone your failing powers. I mean, how could you penetrate it? How could you begin to uh, look at your own medical information, even if you had the technical ability? Part of what I'm talking about here is Will some kind of agent be needed to help us manage our life information? And could that be a conversational um, agent? Not only to keep you company, but to do what Victorians once called putting your life in order, putting your affairs in order, excuse me. Um, towards the, it doesn't have to be at the end of your life. I mean, pop stars write autobiographies at 25 now, and that's just the first volume. I mean, you can, you can assess your life at any time, even if there's nothing to say. And of course, th that organized repository of your life, that organized life story that you've wanted to tell, possibly with the aid of a companion, of course, will be something to hand on to your relatives later. And we'll come to that later about what do you do with a companion when you die. Um, how do we know whether people want these things? We did a few experiments in the Companions Project. Um, some were positive, some were negative. It depends who you talk to. It depends how you ask the questions. But we've got a lot of other ancillary evidence, anecdotal mostly, of the fact that people will form relationships with almost anything. Um, you know, like ducks famously will follow toad batch boxes. Um, people fell in love with, Tama not fell in love with, people established emotional relationships with Tamagotchis and Furbies. Um, David Levy has written a book in the last few years um, about people's willingness to form emotional relationships with robots and with all kinds of mechanical things. There's all the evidence we could want that people won't have any trouble. Um, there's other evidence that people with pets live longer, reminiscing, reminiscing pro helps prolong your life, and so on. Um, this is the slide I think I've shown too often, but I love it so much. It comes from the BBC archives. When the BBC were doing a programme, and I know, I know the faces in the audience who've seen it, I'm so sorry, but just in case you haven't. Um, BBC archives, the BBC to programme on essentially primitive Jap Japanese companions, and that yellow rag doll down the bottom right is called Primo Puel, not, not, not genius at naming products, but it's a genius product. It chatters away in Japanese gibberish. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't understand. It just chats in nonsense Japanese. It puts out a stream of nonsensical Japanese when you turn it on. And the point is, Akino, which is what that lady is called, um, she loves it. And she says, she says two things which are of interest, and I've said many times before. She felt comfortable at home, even when it was lying on a bed in another room chattering. She liked that. It's like having the TV on in the background. This was just chattering away. And it gave her more comfort than her husband's shrine. <laughs> so this was, a, this was an avatar. This is just an intro into the project now. This is an avatar we used for a while. It was a plastic rabbit from Paris. But the idea was that 
what a companion will have, to, one thing it'll have to be is, in some sense, the same thing wherever you find it. Whatever device you find it on, um, you might always want it to have the same personality, you might not. We'll come to that later. It isn't obvious you want a companion always has the same personality. Um, some people prefer lots of friends. Some people prefer lots of wives and husbands. I mean, you can, you can take different views of how many personalities you want in your life and whether you want someone always to have the same personality. The Companions Project, though, unrepentantly, is, all, is about language and about emotion and relationships expressed through language. In that sense, it's rather different from a whole range of projects, many of them in Europe and America, mostly in Europe, called um, Embodied Conversational Agent Projects, ECAs. Those tend to be... Those make much better television than what I'm showing you because they tef, tend to have big grinning lips and big starey eyes and fluttery eyelids. And they concentrate much more on facial expression and getting some face you can relate to. This isn't what I'm talking to is not about that. It's about relationships through conversation. And of course there's space for both those both those approaches. This is not novel. Those of you who are, this is Oxford after all, giving a touch of class here. Um, uh, Mary Shelley was onto this, if you know that quote in the centre. Took me a while to find it. I knew it was there in Frankenstein somewhere. But that is the monster towards the end of the book. You have to wade through about 40 chapters to get to this bit. And that's, uh, that's um, chapter 20, sorry, I lie. Shall each man, cried he, this is Frankenstein's monster, right? Um, it's an artificial companion, obviously. Me meets all the criteria. Shall each man, cried he, find a wife in his bosom, and each beast have his mate, and I be alone? I had feelings of affection, and they were requited by detestation and scorn, and so on. Um, not quite the chap we're aiming for, but I'm just pointing out that this idea has been around quite a while. Okay. Let me just tell you something about the project itself now, and then a few general, questions, a few general issues in the demo. So this comes from many colleagues at Sheffield who are part of this and not, not just Sheffield, but in other universities and companies. So the senior companion application that you'll see now is very, quite limited. It's for reminiscing about photographs and attempting to build up facts about your life that it can elicit from you from your photographs. Um, it's multimodal, multi it's got dialogue, it's, it, it has speech, you'll hear the speech. It uses web services, they're important. I wanted, I'll say this perhaps in more detail in a moment, but one of the curses of artificial intelligence over 50 years and one of the things its critics have concentrated on is that computers know the things they know. In artificial intelligence, you say, this knows something, and it knows exactly what you've told it. If it knows about cities, it knows the cities you've told it about. It knows about Pisa and Venice and Rome, but it's no idea what Milan means, okay? I mean, because it doesn't know. Um, what I wanted was a system that could go out. In some sense, the Internet is limited. The Internet doesn't know everything. But we don't go far wrong if we think the Internet does know everything. If you think Wikipedia knows everything, you're not far wrong. Inter Wikipedia knows about towns down to a population of about 1,000 that you're never going to go to. I mean, you could say roughly Wikipedia knows about everything. Um, so this goes out to the web for places and, and things like that to find out about places. So if it hears the name of a place and guesses it's the name of a place, it doesn't have to know about it. It goes out and finds out about it and then says something to you that shows that it knows. Um, this seems to be quite crucial. Breaking out of this box of known things that virtually all AI applications have to have, in a sense, potentially real-time knowledge of the world in the way that we're able to do. So reminiscences about photos. When I said pictures of children, uh, you're not allowed to put up pictures of children anymore, as you well know, unless they're your own. So these happen to be mine. <laughs> That's not. Um, so there we are. So you could think of what we're doing here. You'll, you'll see the demo in a moment. But um, the, the avatar will talk to you about your pictures, ask you about them, ask who the people are. It, it can see where there are people in the pictures. It's got enough finding of faces to, to know when there are people and how many, ask you about who they are, um, what relationship they are to you, where the photo was taken, what it means to you, and so on. But if you'd like to think in Facebook terms, and many of us do, um, this is just a very complicated way of tagging photos. Okay, I mean, you know, what Facebook does, you write on the back of a photo, don't you? you can write, you know, Octavia Venice 2007 holiday. Well, you can think of what we're doing here as using dialogue to tag a photo with a whole piece of discourse. It's like a very, very large tag, not a few atomic words, but a page of discourse about this photo. So if you wish to think of this as just a very large tagging exercise, you can. You wouldn't be wrong. And the aim of it all behind it is to build up something about the life of the person. Um, I, I was stimulated to do this, I think, by reading once that people in old people's homes spend much of their lives sorting through old photographs, sorting through these old sepia tints, trying to remember who they were married to, trying to remember what their children are called, trying to remember where they were in 1935. Um, this gets harder and harder, as many of you do know, and some will. Um, but 
I suspect that a lot of this could be drawn out of people with conversation and then recorded. So, and then, I mean, by recorded, I mean structured, not just written down, but structured into something like a life narrative, which is what we're talking about. So it has avatars. You'll see several avatars. Oh, sorry, you won't. In the demo, you saw the little plastic rabbit there, but the, the, um, the avatar you will see is the dog with the wig. Um, this is my all-time favorite avatar. Um, you may not share. Oh, we wanted this northern poet as well. He was quite good. We had Ken Dodd at one stage, but we were told to stop it because the English could tell it was Ken Dodd and didn't like it very much, and foreigners thought, who's this wrinkly old man? So, that, I mean, Ken Dodd had to go as an avatar. Um, we, we picked him because um, we wanted the companion also to tell jokes and read the news. He reads the news and he tells awful jokes that he gets off the web. But you have to be very careful where you get jokes from off the web. Mm -hmm. Most joke websites are dirty. We only, we only use children's websites for demonstrations. But, uh, but the dog with the wig is my all-time favorite, and you'll see in a minute whether you agree with me or not. So it has what's called Open CV, which is some clearly elementary face recognition software that can spot how many daughters you have in a photo. It has completely off-the-shelf speech. Um, for the Czech part of the Companions Project, they did a great deal of good speech recognition work. But for English, it just isn't worth it. I mean, there's such good commercial speech now. Um, when I say commercial speech, I mean a system you can buy for 100 or so dollars, but of course it can only tune to one, one speaker. But for a companion, it doesn't matter. A companion is for one speaker. Perfect. I mean, what a nice coincidence of price and opportunity and scientific level. And the key part of it all is the area which, of this one, of course, the area I've worked in, natural language understanding, which is all those words down there, which may mean not much to you, are just, as it were, um, bits and pieces of what you have to put together to make a system appear to understand. I spent 10 years before I worked in dialogue at Sheffield working on and starting up, and I don't work on it anymore, a thing called GATE, the General Architecture for Text Engineering, which is a thing that's been downloaded thousands of times across the world. It's been quite a successful non-commercial product. Um, it's, it's just a very large platform for doing language, language engineering, and it's, it's quite useful, and that underpins it too. It finds all the names and the the people relations and the places, and it knows their places. It's, it's what, if you know the technical words, is called information extraction, which is a kind of technology that grew up in the early 90s, and we spent a long time on in Sheffield. Um, in fact, one of the original features of this is to try and do language understanding by information extraction. Information extraction was a technology designed to read newspapers at very high speed and to get out, say, commercial facts or facts for the security agencies. It wasn't designed for looking at dialogue. So this was an experimental idea here to try and use that technology on dialogue, and to do so because, for the reason I said earlier, that dialogue tends not to be in well-formed English, for which automatic parsers work, that turn things into nice, well-formed structures. Information extraction is a more superficial technique that grabs facts out of things as they go by. It's much beloved in the security agencies who, who are listening to your phone calls, as you know, and that's the kind of technology they're using. Um, behind that, having got... Um, having snatched out these information extraction structures, which are really loose structures, not awfully far from the structure of English. It's got, um, it's got structures it pulls in from the web, from, um, from Wikipedia and from Facebook. It doesn't start always with you asking about the initial photographs. It knows quite a lot about you already because it's gone to your Facebook. It's gone to your Facebook and found who your friends are. And so it, it knows some of the people in the photos already because it's found your Facebook entry and has seen who you, who you have in there. Um, it's got a, a reasoning system behind it, which is a set of rules called Jena. This is all a little bit technical. But one important thing I would emphasize, it's, it's what I would call in a broad sense a semantic web application. Now, that's a phrase that will either mean something to you or not. If it doesn't, don't worry. If you know what semantic web is, what you could loosely call Tim Berners-Lee's second good idea. His first good idea was, of course, the World Wide Web. Berners-Lee's second idea was the semantic web, which was how to get the internet to, as it were, understand what's on it. Um, just the World Wide Web, of course, is a World Wide Web of documents and images, but the internet itself doesn't know what they are, any more than your television knows what it's showing. Right? Your television doesn't know what it's showing. You know that. Um, the semantic web was the idea that if the content of the web could have its content extracted and be known to some sense to could be accessed separately. This is a very tricky idea, and some people think it's nonsense. I, I half believe in it. If you could extract the content of the documents on the web and have the content accessed, then the World Wide Web would know what was on it, and it could answer questions for you. At present, it can't really answer questions. And that was what he called the semantic web. And this application here is a semantic web application in the sense that it goes out to the web and drags stuff off Facebook and Wikipedia in a form called RDF. RDF, resource description format, needn't detain you. It's a, it's a new movement in the semantic web environment which extends what I talked about earlier as going for more superficial methods like information extraction. It's trying to see how far we can get without 
as it were, a great deal of linguistic depth, and with less depth, but with shallower methods, and to see how far we can get. Now, many people, particularly linguistic colleagues, don't like that. They believe, and they may, be, may be turn out to be right, that unless we have a good logical or linguistic analysis of what's being said, we can't get anywhere. I have never believed that. I don't believe it now. I don't believe that's what people do. I think the extraordinary thing about human dialogue and human survival is we get by without listening to a great deal of what's being said to us or a great deal of what's passing in front of our eyes on the page. Um, any cocktail party confirms this, but you can confirm it in other ways. I mean, people, I do believe, are not... This is just a hunch. I mean, I can't prove it to you. I believe people are not processing very deeply what they hear unless they have to. Philosophers process almost everything they hear very deeply, which makes their conversation a little slower and more stilted than the rest of us, and it can be annoying. But most of us get by by just carrying on, skating across the surface, grabbing from the language what we need as we go by. And in a sense, the application I'm showing you is an attempt to see what you, how far you can get. Triple stores, all semantic web talk, stacking up the content of language as these very simple, non-linguistic triples of information, rules, Little bits of reasoning to reasoning if, if these two girls are sisters, that means they have the same mother and father, or you know, if they're real sisters and so on. Inference rules that enable you to put people's relationships together and build up pictures of their family. So we'll come to things like, here are my daughters, Zoe and Octavia in New York City. Infer using family relations rules that Zoe and Octavia are sisters, Roberta is the mother of Octavia and Zoe and so on. Then there's a whole lot of semantics that you don't want to hear about. What I told you just there was how you get the structure, but of course you've got to have what we would call semantics of objects. You've got to know which object is which that you're talking about, and that George Herbert Walker Bush is not the same as George W. Bush, and this is important, and it's very easy on the internet to mix these two men up. They went to the same universities. They had the same job. I mean, do you realise how difficult it is to sort people out on the internet? Um, and so on. Behind this is lots of quite boring, but well-established, not original to me, although I've worked on it for years, um, technology on how to sort people and things out. Um, there's more tech stuff there. I think we've had enough of that. There are, there are scientific questions behind all this. That was a little more British Computer Society stuff. Use, I said this already. Using information extraction to get an established technology to get content out. Using... I flashed by that little stack you didn't even look at. New models of dialogue management. How, what kind of virtual machine do we need to run a conversation? Um, a lot of chatbots don't think you need much of a machine. Something is said, if it matches, say the next thing, and so on. That's a parody. But much conversation can be done by just matching something and then saying something that you've got stored with it. That's how Colby's parry worked 40 years ago. It just had a big stack of separate things you could say, so it didn't always repeat itself. Um, nowadays, I think, People who believe in structure and what I will call virtual machines for conversation believe that there will be some other entity running a dialogue. Otherwise, how can you explain how we can go back to topics we haven't finished? We stop talking about this and we go to that. Two minutes later, we come back to this. How could you do that unless there was some quite complex memory of what's been said and how far you've got in talking about it? That thing I flashed by very quickly there, which isn't appropriate for here, is a virtual machine um, to try and see how you can change topics, how... You, the user, can suggest topics. How I, the companion, can suggest topics. We can go back to topics we haven't finished. We can return to topics and not repeat ourselves. That requires quite a complicated computational machine, which I think it's not appropriate to bore you with here. Um, linking the system of semantic web to open knowledge. Um, some components which are learned. There are components in there I haven't emphasized it, which are learned and not just taught. I mean, it learns. Well, I've had enough of this. Here. Let's go to something else. I'm sorry. So I realise that I'm looking around faces and thinking they don't want to hear about any more computational linguistics. Um, breaking out, I talked. Oh, sorry, it hasn't come out. The Mac thing hasn't come out very well in, um, in on this um, Word machine, on this um, Microsoft machine. Sorry. Um, I told. I spoke about how it breaks out of the boundaries of what it knows, and you'll see that in the demo. How it can go and, and say something about a city it's never heard of before. Um, emotions. Um, I ceased to be part of this project about a year ago, and it changed direction for its uh, last year, year and a half, and it's moved on to a different kind of model now, one I don't altogether feel attracted to. It's gone, its current um, paradigm is called How Was Your Day, which it, it's based on emotionally cheering up a depressed office worker who comes home and talks to it, and it, and it says, you know, it isn't all that bad, you know, I'm sure you'll get promoted. Um, what you might call... <laughs> no, it does, I'm not joking. You can see it on YouTube, like you can see my one. Um, it has local responses to emotion. I feel this is... I'm being a bit catty now. I feel this is really just Eliza 40 years on. It's local responses trying to cheer people up and give immediate emotional reactions. I think emotion will have to play a much deeper role in understanding um, 
language and dialogue. Uh, Simon Worgan, a colleague at Sheffield, had some very original ideas for how emotion might play a much more global role in understanding dialogue. He had a diagram like this where you could, um, a companion and a user could, as it were, one could track the other round a negative and positive space. If you think of the objects in that space as being um, big pieces of network that control the conversation, the things that go in those stacks I didn't show you, um, you could see there as somehow if the user, that's the solid rings, um, makes a move around this space, maybe the companion should adju adjust its emotional response towards it, either to pull you out of whatever state you're in, or to push you further into it, depending on what the state is. If the, if the user is showing that they're a very happy person at the moment, maybe the companion should, as it were, try to move you, keep you happy, and make you happier. If you're miserable, maybe it should pull you back towards the centre and make you less miserable. Some sort of global navigation, and not just a sort of immediate knee-jerk reaction. This is a very delicate business. Um, Computer theories of emotion used to be sort of laughed at. When I first heard of them 30, 40 years ago, I laughed at them. I thought, whatever artificial intelligence is, it's not about emotion. There are a few lonely people, even in British AI. Aaron Sloan is a famous case. He's a bold and man who's had the courage of his convictions over many years. He believed 40 years ago that emotion would be important for artificial intelligence. And he's been proved right. And I was completely wrong. And the trouble is, though, is the kind of theories we now have for emotion tend to, like John Wisdom used to say about philosophical discoveries, they tend to be platitudes. Um, a typical theory of emotion in AI is that emotion is about frustrated plans. Well, sometimes that's right. I mean, when we see murders on the slip roads of, of motorways, we know very well that some emotion is about frustrated plans. You get in front of that guy on the slip road, and he gets out with a horsewhip and whips it, and all gun or whatever it is he happens to have in the driving in the in the glove compartment. But I mean that's a frustration. He had a plan to join the motorway. You blocked him, he gets out and beats you up. I mean a clear case of emotion as frustrated plan. But the trouble is that doesn't cover all emotions. And that's what I mean about platitude. Uh, the theories of emotion tend to be lists of platitudes. Is it appraising an event? Well yes sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Is it a loop of responses? Well yes sometimes and so on. They they don't build on the whole to a um a com they Computers and emotion is not yet in a state where there's a unified theory we can understand. We can only build in bits and pieces. And one extra trouble is you'll probably want, I suspect, in the future, a companion to be emotionally different at different times. If you want a companion to train you in a gym, you'll want it to be harsh, no pain, no gain. Um, uh, people differ culturally, sex-wise, nationally, over what emotions they feel are appropriate. I mean, English people know this better than some because we're often uh, attacked for the non-globality of our emotional reactions in a range of situations. I mean, you know all this. Cultures are different. Sexes are different. People are different at individual levels. We, it's not clear what overall theory of emotion will, will be like. It is coming, and it's creeping up on us. Um, one thing I hinted at earlier is you might prefer a set of companions, an agency of companions, not an agent, so that you could pick in the morning which kind of person you'd like to have with you all day. Um, that's also a possibility. Maybe you require consistency. Maybe you don't. I talked at the very beginning that... Um, we got into a rut in computer dialogue of thinking it had to be about tasks and carrying out tasks. And I think that's wrong. And I think the companion is not a task. It's a conversation that needn't end. At the one end of a spectrum is a conversation that need never end, like real conversations with a long-term partner or companion. At the other end is how to sell you a bus ticket or how to deal with Expedia in a few sentences whose answers are largely already known in their structure. A lot of interesting I suspect applications for companions in the future will be somewhere in between those two. Um, if companions are going to counsel you as to whether or not you should have uh, a prostate biopsy or, or amniocentesis, um, which is done now by humans and could be largely automated by counsel computer counsellors, that's somewhere in between task and non-task. It also has to be warm and, and friendly and non-frightening. Um, debriefing experiences, and I don't just mean military or espionage ones. All kinds of people need to be debriefed after they've done something. Much of this could be in the hands of a companion. So, what are the distinguishing features of a companion? I'm coming to the end now for a couple more minutes, and I'll just show you the, um, the video. I think a distinguishing feature of a companion as opposed to a task-driven conversationist are there's no central task. There need be no stopping point. It can be a sustained conversation. Ideally, a companion should be with you for a lifetime. It should be someone's companion some form of appropriate relationship with the owner, possibly emotional. It should also, of course, and that follows, be an internet agent because that's where all your information is going to be that's going to know that. Now it's Facebook. In a few years, it'll be far more than that. Um, this is silly stuff I won't stick with, but um, <laughs> a, a suggestion I've made in, partly frivolously at various times is that the Victorian lady's companion had many of the features we might want in a companion. She was polite, discreet, 
She knew her place. She was dependent. Her emotions were firmly under control. She was modest. She was witty if we were lucky. She was cheerful, well-informed, diverting. Looks were irrelevant. Um, Long-term relationship, if possible. We don't want to have to get a new one too often. She was trustworthy. She was discreet. And very limited socialization between companions off-duty with other people's companions. That's an important question to talk about some other time. Um, discretion. If you did have a computer companion, you would want it to be discreet, wouldn't you? Um, you wouldn't want the government taking it over once you died. You wouldn't want the company wanting it back. They'd love to have the things you'd confessed to it and the things you'd said. Of course, Victor Victorian companions were, of course, discreet. There will be internet agents, I'm sure of that. That's a crucial point. I think using the internet may get harder in the near future rather than easier. Some developers are going to make it harder. Commerce, of course, ought to make it easier, but I can see some things coming along that are going to make things harder. Um, personal agents of this might be the ideal way to help the people we've been talking about deal with the internet at all. On long missions, like NASA missions, they've actively talked about companions for a long time. HAL, of course, is the famous one and has given them rather a bad press. But um, I've been to a few NASA meetings lately, and one of the shocking things is how much science fiction NASA astronauts do read. I mean, there's a, there's, it's awful, actually. There's more of a fusion down there in the future than we realize. Um, we've talked about that. They'll talk to each other behind your back. Um, that could be all right. So if you're old people with companions in an old people's home, then getting together behind your back to fix a lunch if you're shy will be good. Um, there are already Japanese applications where phones with your profile talk on Bluetooth to, in your pocket, talk to other people's phones in their pockets, and, and buzz appealingly when you're within 10 feet or so of the, of, of the other. Um, you can, you can, they're already doing great work in Japan, I believe. Um, there are patented applications, I, I noticed a person, who is trying to put companions to children's phones which animals for children's phones, which can talk to each other behind the children's backs and work out what presents they should give to the child. And, of course, the parents will be paying. I mean, you can see the commercial drive behind an application like that. Um, there are clear dangers. Uh, David Levy, I mentioned him earlier. He's here. He's written a book about um, affectionate relations with future companions and the possible dangers that are there. Uh, but they'll be fun. I mean, they'll, as he, he suggested, that companions will be plying for trade and real sort of affectionate, possibly sexual companions will be plying on the applying for trade on the internet personals before too long. Your companion could vet applicants for you. You can think of all kinds of things. Um, more seriously, and more, well, that's not that is perfectly serious, but um, more sort of politically seriously, of course, there will be the inevitable desire of the state and of companies to have access to your account of your life with, that you've left with your companion. All the indiscreet things you've said on the sofa to your companion over 40 years. Um, just as now all the phone companies all the internet providers want access to your data on the internet. They will surely want somehow to get access to your, what you've told your companion, the secret urges, the secret tastes you have, the, the, the things you don't admit to buying to eat in the supermarket. Oh, well, they can tell that on your Tesco card, can't they? But, I mean, you can see lots of information there that you won't want them to have. They'll know all about you. Uh, that may be basically a good thing. Um, uh, if you're going to a hospital in a different country and you're not conscious anymore, you'll want your companion to tell them everything about your medical state. I mean, there are many situations we can see where ha having the companion hand over everything about you within certain constraints will be right. But you want it to be your companion, not the companies, um, not the not the states. Um, companions are coming. You can lay out, as I try to, some general constraints on what the companion's nature should be like, what you might want, what, what you might not. But as I say, the awful fact is people are going to have different needs and different tastes in what they want and will need some choice. What kind of companion do you want on a four-year journey to Mars? Um, what companion do you want to keep you awake while you're driving? That's a very serious application, not just playing the radio, but having something that talks to your nose when you're dozing off. Let's just show you this, and I'll, I'll st I've stopped talking. It only takes a few moments, but I did want to show you the dog with the wig because I think he's a very fine avatar. Sorry if you've seen this before. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Roberta. Okay, why don't you pick out another photo? See me a companion is a first conversational prototype, Sorry, you didn't a very me, simple one, as you'll, you'll see, get the dog. of a system that talks to you about your photographs and your travels and your life in a very elementary way. Mm -hmm. How do you know Zoe? Discusses who's in your photographs, who they are, what their relationship is to you, how old they are, where the photograph was taken, and so on. She's my daughter. It's not a simply can system. 
It's one that can go off to Wikipedia and find information about places that you happen to mention. Aha! Uh -huh. Do you know Faisal Bali? No, I don't. You'll see the wig dog. He's our current avatar. It's a bit of a silly avatar and many people may find it irritating. Mm. I happen rather to like it. Could you please tell me your connection to the doctor? Oh, uh, he's a friend. I can go off to Facebook and find out about your friends so it already knows something about your friends and their relationships. Aha! Uh -huh. We're using the wig dog here rather than a face or a human being because a lot of people react better to companions that aren't too close to the kind of people they're used to. Hi, Roberta. Do you know the name of this person? That's Roberta. <laughs> is this a picture of you? Yes, it is. Mmm, how old were you in this picture? I was 52 years old. Okay. Could you please tell me the occasion when this photo was taken? <coughs> um, this was a family holiday. Aha! Uh -huh. Where was this photo taken? This photo was taken in Morocco. On hearing that the user had been to Morocco, it goes off to Wikipedia to find out where Morocco is, and most importantly, uh -huh. asks a question about something you might have visited in Morocco to show that in some sense it's understood what Morocco is. And this hasn't been pre-stored, it's taken in real time. Aha! Uh -huh. Do you know Faisal Bali? No, I don't. Great place. It also knows what the date is. When was this photo taken? <coughs> this photo was taken last year. Okay, why don't you pick out another photo? Who is the person on the left? Um, that's Zoe. Sorry, I didn't get the name. Please type the name with a capital letter. Is this the same person in these pictures? Yes, it is. What is your relationship to Zoe? She's my daughter. You can see in this bit that it knows who Zoe is, and it's being corrected by the user about her mm. age, which it got slightly wrong. How old is Zoe in this picture? Oh, I didn't mean to stop it, but it's probably, you've got the general idea. Let's leave it at there. Thank you very much. Sorry I've gone on too long. sad about what you're doing because if you think back to man-computer symbiosis although there were practical requirements at that point this was about connecting humans by machine and you're really planning and this is not a challenge or a fault but what you're describing is connecting people to themselves because they're in isolation so <laughs> it's just a it's just a terrible note of sadness there how do you mean explain what you mean I, I probably agree with you when I understand but what do you mean by collecting connecting them to themselves um, uh, well, I mean, you touched upon memory loss on the one hand, uh, yeah, but yeah, also, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if someone's going to be siloed, better not to have them in absolute isolation, as you had with the, the Japanese lady with the, the blubbering pillow mm. uh, device. No, there's a strong amount of truth in what you're saying. Um, I, when facing this, I've tried to think of ways in which you could argue that um, even in the old People's Companion, which is one just possible application, of course, we could easily... Uh, we, this talk perhaps could have been about... We had another companion at the same time, which was to improve your health and lifestyle, which is much jollier, you know, run around the block again sort of thing, and, uh, and so on. But, um, no, but you're right. So we tried to think of ways in which one could argue that not only would people feel slightly better, even if they were alone and solitary, talking to something like this, but it could put them in touch with other people, hence the idea of old people in old people's home using companions to contact each other. I think one can argue that, I, I, but I agree with you. I, I, I take the point that old people debriefing themselves to a machine does have a slightly sad air about it. I think, though, I mean, being old, you know, what's General de Gaulle's... Um, well, the two phrases of General de Gaulle's I can remember. La, vie la vieillesse, c'est du naufrage. Um, old age is a shipwreck. Um, yeah, it's no fun, is it? I mean, so maybe if this makes it a little less awful, I mean, that may be... Um, Hi, yeah, John Domang from the Open University. Um, you, you covered a lot <laughs> in a small amount of time, so of course you, you were very short on some parts. Um, so I wanted to know more about your thoughts about this breaking out. And I was thinking about how to express my uh, question. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, 
um, they've just released uh, Open Graph. So now um, you have 400 million people on the planet who are going around annotating everything, saying what they like, um, and that's available. And his claim is that um, using this technology, Facebook will become bigger than Google because every single new internet or web application will be founded on a Facebook-type platform because in the end, people are social beings and you need that as a starting point. So I guess my question is, do you agree with that, that, uh, that everything should be founded on this somehow social layer and how would that affect this project if you were to start again now, given his claim? It's a really serious question. I mean, I've, I've thought, well, any sensible person the business we're both in, as it were, um, doesn't want to reinvent the wheel. If you wanted to push anything towards application, let alone commercialization, you'd try to put it on top of, well, I mean, to start to compete with Facebook or Google is absurd. So I've, I've indeed, as you say, thought this thought that if one must start, maybe Facebook is indeed, and of course, as you know, they, they allow you to build things on their platforms, that's what they're offering, as, as many people do. I mean, this does already access Facebook. If Facebook, as you say, is transforming itself. If Facebook transforms itself in a certain way, it'd be crazy to start anywhere else. Partly, as you say, because of the links between people, but now this thing about expressing your taste. This, I, I love that phrase, and you used it, I've heard it before. I mean, this phrase of sort of annotating the universe is so wonderful. M many, some of you don't know this if you're not in this business, but I mean, annotation started as, you know, it's what medieval monks used to do to texts. Then in computer people, it became what we did to text. Um, people put in annotations, and then our computers put the annotations in for us. But now, this wonderful new breakout that John's hitting at, that we're going to all going to go around annotating the world, so that since our phone, with our phone presumably, will annotate every building. Buildings it started with, didn't it? Buildings I like, and every time I go by a building, I either like it or I don't like it. I can't decide whether this is mad or the genuine future of things. I mean, if you, there's philosophical implications of this we can hardly begin to take in. I mean, do you remember the Aristotelians and Platonists used to have um, wonderful arguments about, um, oh, it's all that realism stuff, you know, as to, as to, as it were, whether the world consists of particulars or not. But now, with RFID, you know, we're in a world where you could almost stick a barcode or an RFID on every object in the universe. Aristotle would have been very excited by this, because it was what he was trying to say, or Leibniz, that, you know, every leaf on every tree is different, and if it's sending its RFID to us and telling us, no, I'm not the same as that leaf. I, I'm, I'm not being totally frivolous. This idea of annotating the universe. So if, if we should, to answer your question, if Facebook's going to do that, wouldn't it be crazy to start anywhere else, but to, to, you should just build an interface onto Facebook? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Robbie Rutan. I'm a PhD student at USC. Um, I study the way that people connect to their avatars in virtual environments. And, um, and people use avatars often to connect to other people through avatars socially. And this uh, companion paradigm, uh, like Johnny said, is about connecting to the, the technology itself. But I could also see it as a facilitator of connections between people through their companions. And at some point, the avatar that represents me and the, the agent, the companion that I use, blur because I need to present myself to other people and their companions. So, so how, how do you see that going through the development of, of this type of project, through the development of social technologies that facilitate companionship both with technology but through technology with other people? I mean, I suspect that you know as much of the answer to this question as I do, and it's a big one, isn't it? It's a big question, and it, it, the issues would be so different from domain to domain. So, I mean, as the first question reminded me, in some sense, the senior companion is of its nature a slightly sad domain. But just to flip to another one for a moment, I mean, and I've been in discussions of this with other people, in a NASA, I've been in a NASA meeting in Washington last week, and um, if there are... if there, <laughs> I'm obviously trying to sell them this idea, but, they, but it's in hell, as we said. If there were to be a companion on a spacecraft on a long voyage, that, space, that, that companion might be a companion for each individual astronaut, or it might be like Hal was, but not like Hal was. It might be a kind of referee. This is exactly on your point. It might be some kind of referee or stakeholder, or I don't know what you want to call it. Um, just think of the problems that astronauts are going to have with each other after four years. You're stuck in a sardine can with four people for four years. I mean, Sartre has written plays about this. I mean, it's hell, and you know, it's. But it'll be. It will be real. It will be real. And I can imagine an artificial companion, which was nobody's special friend, 
but all of their special friends, as it were. Or it had four personalities which were a special friend to each of them, and these four personalities talked to each other and tried to smooth things out because you don't want them killing each other. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Or you just pick the right kind of people to put in the sardine can in the first place so that this isn't going to happen. But I think there are issues there. So I'm really trying to speak to your point about what ways might a companion facilitate social relations. But I suspect, as John said here, I mean, Facebook may be onto this without using the word. Yeah. Um, I have one and a half points. Uh, um, one is is that the the possibilities for profitable fraud are mind-boggling. If you talk to people with parents of a certain age, typically 80s, you'll find that an awful lot of them have stories of the parent being taken by for tens of thousands of dollars or pounds or whatever. And so, if you multiply this by the population of Britain, you find a multi-billion-dollar industry, which already exists. And part of what it does is it generates, in some sense, synthetic companions by post. I mean, you, you, you get, this, this happens in the US for political contributions. You get personalized letters, you know, calling, calling your mother a friend, I mean, written by a computer by someone in a boiler room. You get, you know, people feeding information to keep them interested. You get, you get a lot of very, very slimy stuff going on that, that most of us don't find out until you go through the papers of your, your mother or your father when they finally die. And a lot of money changes hands because of this. And so partly, in some sense, you've been anticipated, but partly the future is, is, the future is rich. Um, and I think the privacy issues of this are going to be extremely important. And, and the, the, the the push for slimy commercial applications is going to be extremely strong. No, you're, you're making a lot of good points. I mean, it used to be guys who came up and off to asphalt your driveway, didn't it? Yeah, they, the they, they still exist. They still, they still exist, yes. But they're, but they're the low-tech the low world. But the, the high-tech world, you should, I'm sorry. But, but, it seems they, but they, talk, they talk. They provide com a certain limited amount oh, yeah, of companionship. Oh, yeah, sure. And, and people, people have... Uh, Talk, talk about surveys, yeah, right. they talk about all kinds of things, they talk about um, lotteries, you know. My, my mother-in-law has won the, 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 the U.S. National Lottery, if it ex ever existed, any number of times now. Um, so the, there's a whole industry doing this kind of stuff already. I mean, to follow your theme, I mean, if we go back, if we went back into the court cases of old-fashioned confidence tricksters, you know, sort of smooth guys and yeah, yeah, special suits who chatted is, up, is social interaction. chatted up ladies in hotel bars. I mean, you probably find that their conversation was very enjoyable. It was very good, and the conversation was right. good conversation, and they felt better afterwards. I mean, I agree. Um, but to, on on the technical aspect, it seems to me, then like so many technical developments, I mean, it's both it's both poacher and gamekeeper, isn't it? It's plus and minus. I mean, yes, yes, ju yes. just as For old people, thing, as you say, with, you're competing with the the expensive human. Uh, that's right, confidence artists. Well, they'll, they're already very sophisticated internet frauds. We know that, of course. I mean, it's a whole topic now. But it seemed, I can imagine, though, if I was a, and I'm, about, I'm in the process of becoming a, a sort of gullible old person getting very sophisticated approaches through the internet, maybe my companion would be the right person to interface because I'm just losing a few cocks. But the companion on reading the letter, if it were the right kind of companion, would know this was a scam. Um, so I would like to think that the companion could be, in part, a detector and protector of those old people. Maybe, although computational linguists haven't been especially good at spam detection so far, so the, the, rec the record oh, isn't too bright. Is that, that true? Way. I thought spam detectors weren't bad. Well, I mean, I'm not just talking about spamming out of the ordinary sense of you know, well, cutting they, they out they all get the 90, They get 99%, but on the other hand, the, the 1% that gets through is still quite a bit. Yeah, but I would call that not doing badly. But I was thinking of a more sophisticated kind of approach. I mean, actual kind of somebody phones your house. With, it could be on the phone, of course. A companion presumably will answer the phone. Um, some complicated spiel, and a, a wise old person would say, I'd rather you talk to my companion to see if, um, if this is a sensible thing for me to talk to you about. I, I can imagine that. I'd like that. I hate answering the phone anyway. You could. Yes, it yeah. could be good. Better phone answer. My wife already does that. She's yeah, yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, Eric, I, I mean, Yorick, if I, um, just, if I could wedge a question in. You often raise these questions, but you often don't give your view on the answer. Well, no, it's like, hard. for example, um, when you die, who should, what should happen to your companion? 
should it be a race story? It I think you should go to Rotis. I want it to be a life story. I want it to be an assistive form of building your autobiography so that autobiography becomes a democratic art and not just for those handful of people who can now do it with or without a ghostwriter so that your relatives will have a companion um, which could be no more than an arrangement of you can get by the way one of the frivolous things I've been doing on the side is a study of death sites and there are dozens and dozens of death sites out there now I'm running an article on it now and uh, which some of them offer to help you build <coughs> tributes to others of course tributes to yourself build your autobiography they're not very sophisticated yet I think a lot of computational linguistic tools in the end and AI tools will help here. But if there were to be, well, you can think of several stages to answer Bill's question. What's being offered by some cheap sites now, and I'd like a companion to help with, is to build your own life narrative, how you want to present yourself and leave yourself. And that, I think, should go, presumably, to your, your, your sons and daughters. I mean, your, you know, your next generation down, so that you know me as I really was, you just think I'm this nice, generous old person, but really, when you read about my life, you'll be horrified. I mean, that's what I, my son's sitting in the audience, I mean, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to go to another stage, of course, I know many of you know this, um, the ability now to have, of course, um, it copy your voice is already pretty advanced. It le all that time, it's learning to speak like you. Um, avatars which now have your face are well within scope. If any of you look at the avatar Emily coming out of Manchester. She's one of the most stunning avatars I've ever seen. I mean, it's very hard to believe she's not real until she takes her face off at the end of the <laughs> internet demo. When she takes her face off, you realize she isn't. But I, I, I thought she was real. She's the most lo So, and these now can be made from still or video photographs so that there can be an avatar of you. So I'm afraid the final stage of your companion, I'm afraid, is that it's possible to envision now that it becomes you and your children can go on asking you questions. And, uh, you know, where did you and my father meet? You never told me. But the companion will know. And if it has the face and voice of your mother, many people might find this unacceptable. But I think I could live with it and ask them questions. And, you know, and then, then they'll tell you, of course, they want, want how they want you to go on voting for them. I mean, there's all kinds of other silly extensions we need to go into. You know, why, why shouldn't the dead vote? They do it, Ireland. Why shouldn't they vote here? You know, to, to quote an old racist story. I mean, <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, could we, uh, could we thank you all? Thank you very much. Thank you.